Uh, this week, I saw the, uh, the most amazing testimony. I, I mean, it, it brought tears to my eyes, literally. An incredible example, a bold proclamation of faith. When I saw it, I mean, just emotion welled up within me. Uh, I saw a couple of people share their faith. I think it was a brother and a sister. And it was so innocent. And it was so pure. And it was so powerful that it just blew me away. I was watching an episode of a show called Call of the Wild Man. Has anybody ever seen Call of the Wild Man? Raise your hand. I love that show. And uh, it's on Animal Planet, which, by the way, is surprisingly human. Uh, that's their little motto. The uh, Call of the Wild Man, the main character here is a guy named Turtle Man. I, that's confusing to me. I don't know why Turtle Man has a show called Wild Man. But uh, Turtle Man, what he does is, well, he's a wild man. So what he does, he goes around and he catches giant snappers. I saw one like, he took two guys to get up in the boat. Uh, and he catches uh, possums, uh, coyotes, foxes, flying squirrels, bats, uh, he, uh, raccoons, skunks, and he does it barehanded. So he's a crazy man. And everywhere, he's just incredibly popular with, with the kids. And in this particular episode, he, uh, I don't know what he had done, but he had helped a family clear out some critters. That's what he calls them. He's got this great backwoods mountain folk accent. And, and it ended with this pretty, pretty little girl uh, in her inevitably shoeless and shirtless brother. If you've seen the, seen the show, it takes place in Kentucky. That's the way it is. She looked she, like she was about seven or eight years old. Her brother was a little bigger, uh, nice, good belly on the guy. And, and with pride in her voice, this was so beautiful, she said, I wish I could talk like her. Everybody in Kentucky knows Turtle Man. And I can't wait until the whole world knows about Turtle Man. And when she said it, it sounded like, to me, like she choked on emotion. She was making this bold proclamation. Everybody in Kentucky knows Turtle Man. I can't wait. She went like that. Till the whole world knows about Turtle Man. And that got me. That really got me. And she paused, and then she explained herself by saying, he's just the greatest kind of guy I know. And so, of course, she wants the whole world to know about Turtle Man. And her brother, who was not as vocal and was standing there quietly, added proudly, I just love him. <laughs> When's the last time you ever witnessed like that? When's the last time you ever spoke about Jesus Christ like that? I couldn't help but wonder, what if every Christian on the planet felt that way about Jesus? He's just the greatest kind of guy I know. I can't wait till the whole world, I can't wait till the whole world knows Jesus the way I know Jesus. In another episode, a little boy, as a turtle man driving away, he said, you're my hero. That's hero if you don't speak mountain talk. Hero, you're my hero. Is Jesus Christ your hero? And would you shout that? Jesus is my hero. What would happen if you and I spoke about Jesus like these kids speak about Turtle Man? You know, all too often we don't. We get real, oh, I need to do apologetics. I need to get fancy. Oh, I need to wait for the right moment. I've been setting this person up for a few years. I don't want to shock them by saying I love Jesus. Got to kind of ease them, plant a few seeds. Planting seeds is code for not doing anything most of the time. I don't want to shock them by saying Jesus means everything to me. I don't want to shock them by saying I wish the whole world knew Jesus the way I do. And so we're always kind of molding them, shaping them for just the right time when we can hit them with the gospel. You know, I never see that approach in Scripture, but that's the way we do it because we know better. And we know better than these kids who just would floor people with their testimony. 
you know what? We're not like the kids, and I think that is the problem. Jesus Christ said we should have faith like kids. I wonder if that's part of it. Just looking up at him and say, wow, Jesus is awesome. Part of the problem, at least for me, I think, is actually doubt. Now, that might surprise you because you've heard me say that uh, ever since I was a little kid, I haven't doubted the existence of God. I don't. I think about things logically. I said if, if, a, if a equals B and B equals C, then C equals A, and you know, put everything together, think about contradictory statements and what's true and what isn't, and it just is evident to me that God is real. So I, I don't doubt that God is real. I don't doubt that uh, his way is best. I don't doubt that, that he loves me uh, with my mind. But sometimes my heart betrays me. Yeah, God's real. Yeah, God, God loves me. Yeah, I believe all that. But then I, my feelings are as if I don't believe it. Because deep down, I think in our own hearts, sometimes we doubt God. Now, we don't doubt that he's there most of the time. I mean, sometimes people go there, but not usually. We doubt that he knows what he's talking about, right? God says, go out into the world, tell everybody, and, and command, I command you, teach them to obey me. Uh, we can't talk about things like commandments and, and, and rules, and we can't tell people they have to obey Jesus. Uh, I don't think Jesus knows what he's talking about. He commands us to go share our faith. And we say, oh yeah, yeah, up here, total agreement. And, and I'm planning on it someday i got to bide my time. i got to plant, plant more seeds. Water them patiently. Ooh, ooh. Not too much water. <laughs> I love Jesus. What would you say? Oh, nothing. Just plant a seed. <laughs> try, to, try the stealth approach. Again, I never saw anybody in Scripture try the stealth approach, but I'm pretty sure it'll work, right? Jesus commands us to go. We're commanded to speak. We're commanded to love people, to honor him. We're commanded to honor him with our finances. Maybe. Don't know. Commanded to love our enemies. Who is your enemy? Not the person who just loves you and builds you up. Although sometimes we treat the people close to us like our enemies. Who is your enemy? Yeah, ultimately Satan. We're not supposed to necessarily love him. When Jesus said, love your enemies... He's saying the people who treat you badly. But ultimately, we need to see that Satan is the real enemy. People are not our enemies. But Jesus is saying the people who treat you badly, the people who mistreat you, the people who gossip about you, the people who want to work you over, Jesus says, I want you to care about them. I want you to love them. And you know, love, we, we can get too philosophical about love. Oh, yes, I, I love them. Boy, I can't stand them, but I love them. I'll tell you what. Love is greater than feeling, but it's not less than feeling. And if you can't stand somebody and your feelings toward them are just nasty all the time, don't tell me that you love them. Love is better, greater than feeling, but it's not less than feeling. Jesus said, love your enemies. Do you trust him or do you doubt? Are you messed over with doubts and fear? Why? Well, right now, trying to think of all these reasons why I can't love that person. Because, because what? Because what? Jesus says love them. God says love them. Do you doubt or do you believe? We can tweet things that we wouldn't repeat in church, but I don't think it would be appropriate for me to put church in my tweets. Well, who said that? Can you find that for me in Scripture? Go ahead and, and tweet jokes that you'd never tell in church, but thou shalt not bring church into your tweets. What the heck? That's a value from our culture, maybe. It's not a value from Scripture. The challenge is there. Find it. We can cheer for a sports team on the TV screen, but we don't celebrate... The baptisms, the conversions, the, the marriages that are sticking together, the parents who are trying to raise their kids. We're not celebrating what Jesus is doing? 
Now listen, I can cheer for a football team, but I better be able to cheer for the God of the universe who comes down and gives his life so we can find salvation, that we can have eternal life through him. We can post a Bugs Bunny video on Facebook, but we won't post a testimony of a person who came to faith in Jesus Christ and their life totally changed. What's the deal? What's up, Doc? We can share a recipe, but we're nervous about sharing a message that can keep somebody's behind from burning in hell. And it's doubt. It's lack of faith. It's fear. I know it. Up here, no doubt. In here, sometimes I act like I really don't think God knows what's best. I can't help but think about Jesus and Turtle Man and those kids. Those kids, they had confidence in Turtle Man, didn't they? He was a heroic guy. Everybody should know him. Jesus, I'm a little embarrassed. A little embarrassed at Jesus. What do my friends think? These kids are all telling their kids, you got to watch Wild Man. you got to turn on the TV. I don't know if I want to invite my friends to church. Maybe Jesus isn't cool enough, or the church isn't cool enough. Or I, I, I sure hope God doesn't embarrass me. They're not worried about... Turtle Man does stuff like, yeah, 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 and he's doing this kind of stuff. He's, there, nobody's worried about Turtle Man embarrassing them. But we're worried about the one who says, I love you, and I'm going to die for you. And Don't embarrass me, Jesus. How much does Jesus love us? Passionately. How much do we want to love Jesus and the lost? Well, passionate as long as I look cool. Passionate as long as it doesn't look crazy. I don't want crazy religion. You mean you, mean you don't want something crazy enough to, to die for your sins? Well, I guess I'll take that. It's doubt. It's a lack of faith. If I really believed that all the billions of people on earth could go to heaven to have their sins totally forgiven, that my neighbors, my coworkers, my unsaved friends and family could have eternity in paradise, would it change the way I interacted with people? This is my God time, this is the rest of my life. Jesus said, I died for your whole life. Jesus, you do the love thing. I've got too much, I, I got too much wrapped up in myself. Jesus said, you do have too much wrapped up in yourself. Do I have more confidence in what the world says about religion or what Jesus says about faith? If I actually love Jesus a fraction as much as I say I do when I'm singing, maybe loving God and loving other people wouldn't be as hard as it is. Love your enemies? I have a hard time with that. I have a hard time loving the best person in the world that I've ever met my wife the way she deserves. I'm continually saying, God, I need to love this woman more. Love my enemies? I need to love the people around me more. I need to love my enemies. But I've, I'm not going to put that off of me and say, well, I've got all this together. Now I've got to work on that. I've got to work on it all. And I don't think I'm lonely this morning. I'm not lonely this morning. We've got to work on this whole thing because on some level, we're not trusting God, aren't we? We're saying, no, I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to hold on to this little grudge. I'm going to hold on to bitterness. I'm going to speak ill of people. God says, don't do that. Yeah, I think, I think I'll, I'll take this one, God. I think I know better. If I love Jesus as much as those kids loved and trusted turtle man maybe i'd have a better witness it could also be that we just don't care about other people that's you're not supposed to say that are you uh i remember going to japan and i was so 
I dreamed about going to Japan. I just wanted to go and tell people about Jesus. And the, the first time I went to Japan, I just, Lord, send me over there. Please use me. All I want is for my life to matter. I want to bring people to Jesus Christ. And I got over there, and I started to pout and feel sorry for myself. And I, I was living with my boss's family at the time. didn't have a place of my own yet. And underneath their rules. And, and I'm getting bent out of shape. And why did I ever come out here? And nobody was home one day. I was alone in the house. And I just said, God, I really, please break my heart. I, and I just start crying. Because I was so bad. I was just thinking about Dan. I wasn't thinking about all these people that need to know God loves them all around me. And I was so full of myself, I didn't have room to really care about other people. And it broke me, and I just wept before the Lord. And that was important. I don't think God could have used me in Japan if he hadn't broken me like that. And I continue to pray again, again, because I get hard, quick. God, you got to break me again, because I don't think I'm really caring about people. I don't know if I'm loving people the way I should. You know, there was a Time Magazine article. I haven't read it yet. I should, but uh, from June of this year. It's uh, being spoken about all over the Internet. Uh, cover story. Listen to this. Not only do millennials, this younger generation, not only do millennials lack the kind of empathy that allows them to feel concerned for others. So we're saying this Time Magazine front page cover, young people don't have a lot of empathy for other people. Other people, you know, you see a video on TV, something get, somebody get hurt, and you go, <laughs> you don't say, oh, no, I hope they're okay. Not only do they, millennials not feel concerned for others, but they even have trouble intellectually understanding other people's point of views, that's pretty harsh. Like I said, I didn't read the article. To me, it seems obviously unfair and untrue, and it's probably remembering the past uh, through more uh, glowing eyes than it deserves. Uh, human beings have always been messed up. Human beings have always been selfish. To label an entire generation as being unable to understand the feelings of others, I really, really doubt that. And yet, if I asked young people, if I ask millennials themselves this question, do you think that Americans are becoming more considerate of other people's feelings? Do you think that Americans are becoming more respectful of their neighbors and coworkers? I wonder if they wouldn't confirm what the article was saying. I, wouldn't, I wonder if they wouldn't say, no, people are getting pretty rude nowadays. Well, how are we supposed to care about people's eternal salvation if we're always wrapped up in our own world and we can't think about other people. John the Baptist was uh, a man's man. He was bold. He was brave. Uh, he didn't hesitate when it came to living a harsh life. He gave up a lot of creature comforts in order to serve the Lord. He didn't hesitate when it came to calling people to repent. Don't ever believe the lie that 2,000 years ago, people liked it when you said, repent. You need to change. You're out of God's will. Don't think, boy, people like that today, people won't accept that. John the Baptist got his head cut off. I don't think people liked it back then either. Calling people to repentance, though, is important because if they don't, if they don't repent, if they don't say, I'm a sinner, Lord, I've messed up in so many ways, I need your grace, the cross is never going to mean anything for them, and Satan wins. Jesus Christ loved people enough to die for them so that they could turn from their wicked ways and put their faith in him. And if we don't tell people, you've got to turn to Jesus, then the cross has been erased. It's no longer important. The things of God don't matter. John the Baptist was a tough man. He called people to get right with God. He didn't care how dangerous or unpopular it was. He didn't care if he was the butt of jokes. He just spoke the truth. He just spoke the truth. And it landed him in jail. The great baptizer imprisoned unjustly. Do you ever notice on television when they're interviewing a criminal, a lot of times the criminal is just like they think life is no fair. <laughs> they, they commit a crime, and then they, 
they're just upset about having to go to jail. I think I could do that. <laughs> no, I, I don't want, never mind, let's move on. I'm just talking about for my own selfish nature. I do something stupid and trouble comes into my life because I'm stupid and I complain about it. And I say, God, what's, the, what's up? John the Baptist, what was he doing? John the Baptist was doing the right thing. I'm just doing the right thing. Do what God's supposed to, God wants me to do. And where'd John the Baptist end up? In the jail of Herod. Herod was a mean, nasty guy. So a mean, nasty guy has power over a good guy. And Herod is going to eventually have his head cut off because some young girl does a hoochie-coochie dance. And Herod says, I'll give you whatever you want. And she says, give me his head. Okay. Is that fair? That is not fair. There's no way any of you could t explain to me how that is fair. The good man suffering despite the fact that he was good. And in jail... John the baptizer, this great man of God, you know what happened? He began to have doubts. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. After Jesus had finished instructing the 12 disciples, remember last week we talked about how God called the first 12 disciples? After Jesus did this, he went on from there to teach and preach in the towns of Galilee. When John heard in prison, so he's in jail, what the Messiah was doing, he sent his disciples to ask him, are you really the one who was to come, or should we expect another? Keep your place in Matthew. Look at what he does. He's in jail, and he says, go ask him, guys. Get out there. Go ask him. Ask him, are you really the one? Are you really the Messiah? Remember? He was the guy who says, I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. I want you to turn back now to Matthew chapter 3. Keep your finger in Matthew 11. This is multitasking. I, I think you can do it. Uh, Matthew chapter 3, 7 through 11. This is John the Baptist. When he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, hey, fellas, how you doing? No. He said to them, you brood of vipers. Who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? God's wrath is coming. And who told you to run? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. You say you repent, now act like it. And do not think that you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children of Abraham. The ax is already at the root of the trees. And every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance. But after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. He's talking about Jesus Christ, right? The cute guy who's always carrying the lamb. John the Baptist says he's going to come in, and he's going to sort out the believers from the unbelievers. In the Gospel of John, different John, it's recorded when John the Baptist saw Jesus, he called out to the crowd. He said, look, the Lamb of God. The Lamb, means, the Lamb of God means the one who's going to be sacrificed for our sins. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the whole world. It seemed like he had confidence about Jesus then, didn't he? I kind of imagine him standing out in the water. He's been baptizing hundreds and hundreds of people. Jesus comes along. Behold, the Lamb of God. He's boldly declaring, you know what? There are days when we boldly declare and there are days when we struggle with doubt. When John's life didn't go the way he expected, he's in jail. Now he tells his guys, guys, go out there and ask him, are you really the Lamb of God? Are you really the Messiah? Now he's in jail. No fault of his own. Starting to wonder what's going on. Back in Matthew chapter 11, 4 through 6. So they come up to Jesus, right? They come up to Jesus. And this is like prayer. They come up to Jesus and say, are you, are you really the one? And Jesus says, boy, I like John, so he's going to get out of jail and everything's going to be okay. I wish that's the way God answered him. 
Brothers and sisters, that's not the way God answered him. Jesus replied to these guys, these followers of John the Baptist. He said, go back, report to John what you see and hear. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk. Those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear. All these things are things mentioned in the prophet Isaiah. In the Old Testament, when the Messiah comes, these things are going to happen. So he's saying, go back and tell John, Isaiah, the Old Testament is being fulfilled in me. The deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. And then he stops and he adds, blessed is anyone who has not stumble on my account. Blessed, happy, lucky is the person who spiritually, they don't fall down because of Jesus. John's in jail and Jesus is saying, hold on, buddy. Don't stumble because of me. There's something else that's going on here. And uh, dad is, dad is, pointed it out a couple of times. Uh, I'm sure that uh, Jesus didn't do this by accident. I'm sure that the, uh, the apostles of John recognized it. Uh, Jesus is quoting mainly from two places in Isaiah, chapter 35 and 61, claiming to be the Messiah. And he goes through, he says, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom to the captives and release prisoners from the darkness. Jesus is saying, blind, he, blind given sight, check. Leprosy healed, check. The poor hear good news, check. And then Jesus stops, and he doesn't finish what they would expect him to say. When he started talking, I wonder, John's apostles thought, good, he's going to proclaim freedom for the captors. He's going to set the people free from jail. And Jesus doesn't say that. He doesn't say it. He skips that part. Now we know that Jesus sets us spiritually free from the jail of our own sin when we put faith in him. But Jesus was maybe saying something pretty hard, pretty sad to John. Don't fall away because of me. He, he, all these things are happening. Now listen, don't fall away because of me because I'm not going to answer that prayer and you're not getting out of jail. Jesus did not say that he would bring him out of jail. Now why? Well, I think it's obvious. He didn't like him, right? If, if, yeah, thank you for laughing about that, John. That, I was being facetious. When God says no, is it because he doesn't like us? He's not pro Maybe God was disappointed in John. Man, what are you wearing that weird clothes for and eating locusts for? What's wrong with you? You're going to get your head cut off. Uh, no. Listen to what Christ says about John. Matthew 11, 7, uh, 7 through 15. Listen to this. As John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. So they're within earshot. You get the picture? He tells them, tell them that you've seen everything happening. The Old Testament's being fulfilled. And then he stops, doesn't finish the prophecy. He says, and go tell them, don't fall away because of me. And these guys may be a little dejected. And they're turning around walking away. And as they're walking away, Jesus is talking to the crowd. And he says to the crowd, did you guys go out into the wilderness? What did you go out to see? A reed that just bends with the wind? This idea is somebody who's got no internal fortitude. When they're with people that love God, they, they look like they love God. When they're with people that are just nasty, they look like they're just nasty. You see, there's nothing, there's no fiber to them. They're just going in the wind. He said, did you go out to see some weed, uh, some, some reed that's just swaying in the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No. Ones who wear fine clothes, they're in palaces. Then what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet, this is the one about whom is written, John the Baptist was prophesied of in the Old Testament. I will send my messenger ahead of you and prepare your way before you. John the Baptist, Old Testament, the prophecy about him was his job was to prepare people for the coming of Jesus Christ. Truly, I tell you, among those born of women, which is like pretty much everybody, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. God put his stamp of approval on John the Baptist. God, looking down from heaven, says, I approve this tough, strong, hard-headed man. I approve. In the kingdom of... Uh, 
God, God's putting a stamp of approval on John the Baptist and the disciples of John going away, they hear that. Yet, whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been subjected to violence and violent men have been raiding it. For all the prophets and the law of the prophets prophesied until John. And if you are willing to accept it, John is Elijah who was to come. Whoever has ears to hear, let him come. So John came in the spirit of Elijah, coming to prepare the way for Jesus Christ. Jesus was, in effect, giving John the message, you're not going to go free, but understand, I am who you thought you were, and I'm very proud of you. Lord God, my situation, Lord, we pray, God, God, change my situation. God says, I am God in heaven. I hear your prayers. I love you. I died for you. I'm proud of you. And no, I'm not going to take the cancer away. No, I want you to stay in that job right now. I'm not going to give you a better job. You know, whatever. God answers the prayer sometimes in the way. So see, we, we have faith that God loves us, but sometimes we rightly question whether God's going to answer prayers the way we want him to. Brothers and sisters, doubt can hold us back from trusting God. Doubt can keep us from obeying God. Doubt can keep us from loving other people the way we're supposed to. That's why we get together like this. That's why we get together and study the Bible together. To help us remember that Jesus is worthy. Jesus is worthy of everything that we are. Jesus is worthy of everything that we have. Jesus is worthy of being entrusted with everything that we will be. Jesus is worthy of, our, of being entrusted with our eternal souls. God is not shy. He knows who he is. He knows who we are. And he calls us to bend the knee, and that takes faith and it takes love. Larry Osborne, pastor of a large church in California, once said at a conference, Here's another quote that's all over the internet. He said, life is too short and hell is too hot to play church. Life is too short and hell is too hot to just play games at church. Brothers and sisters, he's right. We have work to do. We have souls to save. And Christ wants your car to be used for his glory. Your gas money to be used for his glory. Your smartphone to be used for his glory your conversation to be used for his glory. God wants it all just the way a husband and wife who love each other don't want to share their spouse with somebody else. And if we're going to love and trust Jesus, boy, we better remember that cross, how messed up we are, how hopeless we'd be. Otherwise, we're going to say, God, you're asking for too much. But if I remember that cross and understand, I would be facing eternal damnation he loves me this much that he would suffer for me. And now what he's calling me to is to be a person of love, to care about other people. That's not too much to ask. And I want to say no to myself, and I want to say yes to God. And I want to have as much confidence in my Lord, in love for my Savior, as those two kids who said, all Kentucky knows about Turtle Man. And I can't wait until the whole world knows about Turtle Man. He's just the greatest kind of guy I know. I love him. I love Jesus. And I can't wait until the whole world gets to know Jesus. He is the greatest and the best and the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. And I don't love him enough, but I want to love him more. And I hope as a church, we can grab a whole bunch of other people just as messed up as we are. Maybe not that bad, but anyways, messed up people. Bring them to Jesus so God can love on them too. Let's do it.
Just do it. Let's pray. Lord God, your son Jesus said that we should have faith like children. Lord, help us to proclaim boldly your love for us, what you've done in our lives. Father, help us not to hold back. Life is too short. Hell is too hot. Father, I pray that we don't waste opportunities in our lives. And God, I, I ask God that the influence that you give us in other people's lives, that we don't piddle it away on unimportant things, but we use whatever influence, whether it's small or great, that you've given us, Lord, to boldly proclaim Jesus Christ and to draw people close to your son, Jesus. Lord, thank you for loving us. And Father, I want more love in my heart, so please grant that to me. Grant more love to all of us in this room right now and help us to see things the way you see them, God. Thank you for just being who you are. Amen. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Jamesville Athletic Club.